Before that on BBC Two, Jermaine Greer has the last word. <laughs> I'd like to consider tonight is whether our education system can cope with the demands that we make of it. If parents, whether single or not, have to work, school teachers have to play an increasingly important part in the socialization of our children. Our society is complex and pluralist. How can teachers guide our children through the maze of alternative lifestyles? Can schools deal with the development of sexual awareness and definitions of sexual identity? Can schools teach children how to cope with a future in which many of them may never find paid employment? Can we break down the walls of the child ghetto and reintegrate school with home and the community? Do we really want to? With me to discuss what we expect of education are Anne Leslie, Melanie Phillips, Kathleen Moran, Stella Dadzi, and Yasmin Alibi Brown. Now, the first question I'd like to ask everybody, so we can ground our discussion in something real and personal, is just what your school meant to you. And I'll start with Anne. Well, my parents lived in India, so I was sent to uh, convents in England. The first one I was sent to was a fairly rotten one, because um, they used to take in laundry, and then one day they changed the sign to children taken in instead. <laughs> that was a mistake. Um, obviously, um, then I was transferred to another very good convent where it was, I loved it actually because all nuns are basically mad and there was a certain kind of off the wallness about the teaching which I liked, I mean they, they were, they actually tolerated which you wouldn't think of Roman Catholics and you know women who dedicated themselves to God, you wouldn't think that they would be eccentric but they liked slightly eccentric girls, which I was, and I think it was partly because they had made, particularly in a non-Catholic country, an eccentric decision. So you could be odd, and you could be peculiar, and they would be thrilled to bits, and I think that was quite nice. It gave me a lot of confidence that if I did something odd and peculiar, it wasn't necessarily breaking rules. It might be actually inventing new and interesting rules. So I did like my convent, yes. Mm, I have this theory that the nuns actually debauched me in a way because they <laughs> said to me that I could be a great saint or a great sinner. And I knew immediately which <laughs> exactly, of those two things exactly. I was going to be. But the point is they recognized that this was an eccentric choice to give any small girl. But it's something true. Melanie, how do you remember your school? With great fondness and affection. I mean, school was very important to me. Um, it was a direct grant school, as it was called in those days. Um, I was very happy there. I had a largely uneventful time, um, not surrounded by mad nuns or mad anyone. Um, I, my only uh, grief that I recall was when I was asked to do anything remotely physical, like standing on my head or with my hands, like sewing anything, which was a disaster that literally blighted my week and my entire life. Um, but it meant a lot to me. It expanded all my horizons. I met through the girls at the school. It was an all-girls school. Um, I was exposed to backgrounds and influences that were outside my experience. And what I recall with fondness above all was the teaching. Not all of it was uh, inspired. I mean, in every school there are duff teachers, but there were enough teachers who were truly inspirational um, and who literally uh, lit in me a great love of literature and of history and other um, areas. Now, Kathleen, your history is a bit different, isn't it? Because you left school when you were quite little. Yeah, well, I mean, up until then, my entire um, experience of school was just rows about pants. Um, up until the time I went into the grammar school that I attended, it was just the fact that I was the eldest of eight children, and I think there were only three pairs of pants in the entire house. So there would be constant arguments at about half past seven in the morning. Those are mine, those are mine, and we would end up going without often. Um, and then when I, I got a scholarship to a grammar school, um, it was just the fact that the pants they prescribed that we had to wear were dark blue with very tight elastic around the legs and we would often walk around trying to bang our legs trying to get the blood back in them because it would be cut off. It's an awful place. But after that my parents asked me if I wanted to go to school anymore and I went, no. And they said, oh, okay then. And that was it really. And I, I didn't go to school ever since then. But how many of you were there in the family? Um, I was the eldest of eight. 
And so we you had, had a sort of school right there. Well, exactly, and that was the thing, I and mean, this is why I was lucky, you know, I had a community at home, and, and whenever I went to school, um, I would always feel left out, because we had, a, you know, in-jokes and almost our own private language at home. You know, we, we could just say one word and have each other in fits, whereas at school you would always have to be explaining yourself, and explaining your history, and explaining why you found the sight of the fire engine amazingly amusing. Um, which I still can't quite remember why we did find it amusing, actually. <laughs> nice childhood for you. But you were actually taught at home. Well, in theory, we were supposed to be, but in actuality, not. Because my parents went, you know where the library is, you know where the phone is, there's the bus stop. We've got loads of books around the house, just sort of get on and teach yourself. And so for the first two years, the only things I studied in any great depth were um, the various ways of decorating cakes and um, the occult. Um, I know everything about UFOs and how to bleed ice a cake, but unfortunately my expertise doesn't really um, extend beyond that. In a curious way, she has a rather aristocratic upbringing. I know you always say you come from a working class, <laughs> because girls of aristocratic families were not sent to school. I mean, they, they were occasionally taught by governesses, but, you know, the governesses were, were not very interested in teaching them. They were really basically trying to get off with the young master. And they educated themselves, and it's extraordinary to me. I don't think I would have got educated if I had to be educating myself. I would have stuck with the case of the <laughs> yeah. oh. The thing is that all, child have, all children have natural curiosity, which is drummed out of you at school, because I mean, if it's a beautiful oh, sunny gosh. day and you're being... No, but if it's a beautiful sunny day and you're being told that you have to study maths, you know, you're thinking, well, I'd, you know, I'd rather go on a nature ramble and discover the 15 kinds of deciduous oak in Britain. You know, it's always drummed out of you that there are set times and set places where you can learn, and anything that you learn outside the house, uh, outside the school, um, isn't valid. You know, you can bring knowledge into the school, and it's kind of like, well, you know, that's not part of our curriculum, that's not what we're studying. You know, I, I have no interest in that. And I always find it exceedingly limiting the way that people, the children are taught in Britain, particularly in the I had a very love-hate relationship with my school. I was thinking about your question. I loved the learning. I can still remember the smell of the library and I loved being able to crawl under my covers at night with a torch and read. But I hated the petty restrictions and it seemed to me as a child who was brought into a boarding school on a scholarship for deprived London children, we all spoke like that and we didn't fit in, that there were all these constraints and controls around our life that had nothing to do with real life. I'm talking 60s. Mm. So, for a lot of us as girls, this was in a mixed boarding school mind, you know, the issue was makeup, could we wear makeup, and how long our skirts, so there was this ridiculous rule that you could only wear your skirt three inches above your knees, and there was a senior mistress who used to spend her entire life, it seemed, emerging from the shadows, tearing up your, um, your jumper, and looking to see whether your skirt band had been turned around, whether you'd got a pin in the side to make your skirt tighter around your backside. And it seemed to me that was so irrelevant to the real world. So I had a kind of love-hate relationship with it. But I don't think that is irrelevant to the real world. I think the real world, you constantly, I hate that cliche, push the envelope. But that's what at school is often teaching you to do, which is to see how far you can push rules, how far you but can I, get away. I, I mean, I had the first part of my education in Uganda under the kind of colonial umbrella and then came the 60s, we had all these runaway white people who were either escaping the draft in, in, in the United States or escaping whatever here or coming to do good in a different way. And it was wonderful because I saw somebody white, you know, being completely degenerate for the first time in my school. It was just the most extraordinary experience, How you know, at the age of 15, to see that white people could be <laughs> all sorts of other things that one had um, been taught not to expect of them, including sexually quite avaricious of the little Asian girls they were in, suddenly in command of. And we had this one man, Jim Barrow, who really kind of brought out the, the sexuality in us, which we didn't even know we had then. He arrived in the school with a sports car and said he'd been in Dr. No. He was one of the divers in Dr. No. Now, you know, there wasn't any way of telling whether it was, this was the truth or not, but... <laughs> The explosion that went, you know, through us, all these young little little Asian girls. But I did, I mean, like Melanie was saying, you know, for a lot of us, school was an, an extraordinarily important experience. And my home life was such a monumental mess in all sorts of ways. That school was the family, the stability. Um, and, of course, there was this idea that if there was anybody who had some sparkle or was bright, they wanted to pluck you up and out mm. of your origins and therefore... And bring you on. And, and bring you on. And that happened to a number of us. And I'm really quite grateful 
um, that you know you they did invest that amount of emotional and intellectual kind of um, was it a single effort. sex school no no it was a, it was a mixed school and it had some awful teachers but they cared they really cared and somehow what they taught stayed stayed with you we had this man who taught us Shakespeare who had the most awful pronunciation you know and we used to spend all our time li laughing at him uh, he, he, he would go on and on about oh if I were a hand hand upon that glow I would touch the cheek and we would all fall about laughing at this poor man but I never forgot anything he ever taught me and you know you, we began to love it all because you learn to sort of laugh at it and so we had I mean school was was wonderful but I think this is the crucial point it's, it's to do with the quality of the teachers um, and their, their sort of intuitive gift in teaching when you can have, you know, whatever structure of school you choose and whatever system you devise, it's almost irrelevant in my view because the key thing is the quality of the teacher. Um, if you have a teacher who is able to, to, to touch what is in you and literally, you know, take out of you what is inside you, then it becomes a transformative experience. Um, if you go to a school where you don't, you're not fortunate to be exposed to that kind of teaching, then your memories of school will be very negative. Um, but you're, I mean, you're demanding here a sort of level of charisma in mm. a teacher. Well, there's, there's only one thing I feel I have to say about that, which is that teachers don't have universal charisma. No. Mm. True. Some students can instantly understand mm. what this teacher is driving at, and others will have no mm. respect at all. I'm, I'm very concerned, though, about something else, which is we were probably, all of us, for various reasons, prompted to respect our teachers and to pounce on whatever they gave us to feed on. We were hungry little people. But I can't, I can't feel sanguine that teachers have maintained any level of prestige in society. I, my feeling is they've been humiliated too many times. Well, I think there's a great problem with any figure of authority now. Um, you know, you, you name it, policemen, um, judges, uh, teachers, doctors. I mean, you know, we, we're, we're living in a time which has quite deliberately set out to claw down their claim to be on a different plane. But I think there is a particular problem with English culture. I mean, if you go to other countries, it's an absolute revelation. Their teachers have a completely different social status. They are paid very well in recognition of their extraordinary importance to the to the life of the country and to the to the well-being of individuals and the society. Now in England, I mean, we just don't behave like that to our teachers. I don't think we've, we've ever done. We just devalue teaching. I mean, to to pay teachers as badly as they're paid relative to their importance to the children who are going through their care and to the society that uh, uh, will uh, benefit as a result um, it seems to me to be an extraordinary statement of the values of a, of a country and a culture. And I think this is, you know, it relates to a sort of wider problem in, in England. And I say England because I don't think that Scotland, Wales and Ireland actually have quite this problem. But there is a great sort of anti-education culture. Yeah, but uh, there, is a, there is a failure to understand the importance of education. And there's a sort of yeah, anti-intellectual culture as well. I mean, people who are clever are laughed at or they're sneered at. They are basically not respected. They are considered to be, you know, something well, wrong with them. Yes, but Melanie, I mean, in a sense, it's not to do with money because Japan, in Japan, where education is, I mean, it, it, it's a madhouse, the, the education system there. They, uh, parents send their three-year-olds to crammers so that they can pass jumping tests to get into the top primaries and you have this absolute it's obsession a bit like in with... London, quite frankly. Yeah, no, with, with, I mean, you know, the, the, the children go into... I mean, I did a whole series of articles on Japanese education. It frightened me. And no wonder they're <laughs> so successful because, you know, children went mm. into uh, exams wearing samurai headbands with the, you know, the rising sun on and, and with slogans like forward into victory and everything. The teachers are not well paid, but they are respected because Japanese society sees them as the way that their children can, you know, the, 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 the Japanese mother is the, the biggest Jewish mother in the world. It's, instead of it's my, you know, my son the doctor, it's my son the Sony executive. And they see the teachers as the way that their children can make it in the world. Mm. So although the, the, mm. the teachers are not paid well, they have respect because there is that belief that, you know, education is how you get um, somewhere. Yes, but in this country, Surely it, respect it, does go hand in hand with, with payment. What, Surely. Were, what were you going to say? I was going to say, I don't think it's just about whether teachers are paid. Mm. 
that determines whether they feel valued. I mean, I, I've been a teacher for 20 years, and I am constantly talking to colleagues who not only feel undervalued, but feel totally stressed out and beleaguered. And that is not just about how much pay they get and whether they're recognized for the invaluable job they do. It's also about how they're resourced. It's also about the number of kids they have to deal with in a classroom. And it's about a whole range of other things that aren't actually about money. But what we're dealing with now is a situation where teachers have had to adapt to a completely new ethos of education, where it is about money and it's about quantitative things. I think it's that's right. It's about exam results. It's about things that you tick off in boxes. It's about this abominable league table. And it's Quite. about, I think the two went hand in hand. I don't, ever, I don't know if education was really ever valued in the so-called working classes in this country. But that was one of the first shocks when I came here and I realized that it actually wasn't and I don't know what's responsible for that at all. But the, the two things, the undervaluing of teachers and then the over-professionalizing of the profession so that all the pastoral care, all the bound, boundaries were constantly being laid out as to what teachers could do, should do, felt they were paid to do and, and all the extra bits that made up the best part of one's education. What sort, sort of, of thing do you mean? Do you mean uh, regulations like that you mustn't touch students? Yes, and also the pastoral care. I mean, my teachers took an incredibly important interest in my home life, in the kind of person I was, everything. They didn't feel anything was out of bounds to them. They, f they were another m member of my family. And my family expected that of them, and they didn't feel resentful. My family wasn't going to come in and, you know, push their face in for saying something to me which they didn't want them to say to me. There was a kind of connection, which uh, yes, is... I, mean, I feel kind of schizophrenic about this mm. subject, because there's the bit of me that's the teacher that wants to really defend the people I know who are committed, who want to instill in children a love of learning, which is what I think education should be about, and the reality that there is not enough time to be a good teacher anymore and that the people who are good are the ones who are getting out. If you look at education in the last 10 years, there's been a huge hemorrhage. And the people who've been leaving education, the people who have options, who have alternatives. Now, it's not to say that everybody who's left is no good, but there's a tremendous sense of people feeling under siege in teaching now and not feeling that they are given the time and space to do those extracurricular things that are so important. Now, I'm not sure that that extracurricular stuff is actually that much different. If I think back to my own school, schooling, I don't think our teachers took any notice of what was happening to us outside of the school context. Yes, but the, the feeling that they're under siege is because education has been a political battleground, as we know, for several years. But this business of not enough time, I think, is, is, a, is a bit of a red herring. I was recently in Germany, and, you know, in many ways the German... Uh, uh, school system is, is superior to ours in that it's, it's, it produces a, a higher standard at the end of the day. And I was quite astonished. They're primary schools. Uh, there's a great debate about extending the primary school day to a full day. What do they mean by a full day? They mean four hours. Mm -hmm. What is it now? It's two to three hours. What? And, you know, and at, the, at, the, at the end of the system, they, their children come out better qualified than us. Well, that's, but, you're making my point. Uh, that they actually not have a question of time to invest in other well, things apart from what no, happens in the In fact, it's just they have a, a, a separate kind of system. They have a much more didactic system in Germany. And I, I do, I mean, I know this sounds like, you know, crusty old colonel of, you know, disgusted Tunbridge Wells. But I do think that the, the old didactic system of teaching, it had a lot of faults. I mean, the whole grad grind thing of being obsessed with facts and everything. A horse but, is a quadruped. Yes, exactly. It had those faults, but it did not require star performances from the teachers because somebody who was teaching in the old didactic system had a structure which supported them. Now, every teacher has got to be a star, moving around the class, doing all sorts of things, trying to notice the individual. Most people aren't stars in anything, whether it's, you know, journalism or dustbin uh, collecting. I think what and I think a lot like. of time was wasted. I mean, when you've had time and motion study people who've gone into primary schools and seen how much actual teaching took place in that full school day. And I've found it being something like sort of three minutes. And <laughs> yeah, but happened, yeah, happened, yeah, yeah. I mean, you are here defining what actual teaching is. It's the acquisition of certain skills. Now, the latest thinking is that seeing that most parents are working, whether single or not, that the schools should actually take on board the real shape of the day. And they should understand that, that 
the, if mother works from 9 to 5, if parent works from 9 to 5, school should function from 9 to 5. But it is bizarre to insist that that's going to be grad grind. You learn, you know, the three times table at 10 past 9 and you learn how to spell uh, prestidigitation at 12 o'clock and so on. This is not what it's all about. I think one of the things that's becoming very clear to us is that children are actually at home, they're in solitary confinement practically with two adult warders that they enter the society of their peers, or one adult quarter, <laughs> they enter the society of their peers when they go to school. And that's why it's important for them to be there more. We're talking about, you know, after school care and this, that and the other. That if the, the children, have, it seems to me, should feel that they are building their school. They're not just receiving a certain input at school. They are it. It's not the buildings and it's not the teachers. I'm very concerned about this emphasis we're putting on the charisma of teachers. Most people don't have any, any charisma at no, all. No, but I mean, it didn't matter if you didn't have charisma in the old system. You still had the system, the, the way it was taught. You were still, I mean, we were not taught by charismatic people. We all remember at least one or two people who were totally charismatic teachers. The rest of them were as dumb as any, anybody. But we still learnt under them because there was... But a did we, Anne? Yes, we did. I, I mean, I, when I, I, when I was, under one of the well, when I would, Let me just... When I was teaching in my secondary school, the children had dossiers which proved that they were hopeless. That was the point of the dossiers that they had. They had IQs which weren't worth the paper they were written on. In fact, those dossiers for my children, I taught the A stream and the E stream, which was the worst. And curiously, a whole bunch of dossiers went missing because they could only ever be a millstone around these children's necks. They had lots of skills. They were streetwise. They were children who were in serious trouble. They were doing well to be still alive, half of them. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, it seems to me that the way that kind of education worked was as a system of exclusion. It excluded more people than it included because it was so intensely competitive and all the losers dropped right out of the system and thought, for example, at university entrance, that they had been excluded because they were no good. If you've ever read ACA forms, you realize that people are excluded mm. because 13 out of 14 had to be excluded. Mm. But nobody made it clear to the people oh, who were being excluded. Yeah. Well, the thing is that now I think we well, are I mean, beginning to realize that schools, we can't afford schools that exist to make people feel inadequate. Yes, but are you saying that education should be about education? I know that's uh, begging the question a bit. Or should it be feel good therapy? I mean, I went to the States to do. Uh, some stuff about, you know, politically correct uh, education. And there were a lot of people who were getting into the university system on Afrocentric education, which was basically lies. It was telling them that, you know, Napoleon, when he went to Egypt, he shot off the nose and the lips of the Sphinx in order to hide the fact that the Sphinx was built by black Africans. Now, the trouble was with that is, Why okay. is that a lie, for goodness sake? It, because it was actually a lie, because in fact Napoleon, you, you would see drawings before Napoleon arrived in Egypt where the nose and the lips were missing already. <laughs> yes, but, but the, the point is... The conspiracy no, to but, deny Af Egypt's role. No, I'm not saying that, but if you, if you go too far in feel-good therapy and if you start <coughs> excluding actual facts like that, like for example, they were teaching in New York State about the Aztecs, and going on about the Aztecs is that there were a bunch of pacifist tree huggers. They left out because it might upset and it might disturb the self-esteem of people who are his, from Hispanic uh, countries the fact that human sacrifice took place. And I said to one of the people who was in, in charge of this uh, uh, um, curriculum, what happens when they find out that the Aztecs had human sacrifice? Won't they suddenly feel that you cheated them? You lied to them. You should have told them the whole truth, the good things and the bad. He said, no, because when they're young, they need self-esteem. Uh, and it seemed to me all they were going to be taught by that kind of education was the history of victimization okay, and the feeling and of loss. I have to stop you. <laughs> Look at how many lies. Exactly. Young black people have been exposed to through the curriculum over the years. You know, forget the nose off the sphinx. We are do you think one set of lies needs another set of lies? We are taught a version of, of history that is about glorious white conquest. We're taught a version of geography that no is longer. about Western benevolence. No longer. We are taught children? a whole range of subjects that are Eurocentric in their perspective, that don't take account 
I mean, we're talking about the role of education here, aren't we? But whether it's about a monocultural, parochial set of values, or whether it's about teaching kids to live in the real world. The real world is multicultural. The I'm real world is one that. in which we all but contribute. But do you say that you teach kids lies in no, order to feel good lies. therapy? Because but the we have, good but therapy and we not have already done that. And I mean, we do it when now. in Australia we all learnt that all kinds of white men discovered Australia. They went with black trackers, they crossed the Blue Mountains. Big discovery, they crossed the Blue Mountains. What really happened is that the Aborigines led them through the Blue Mountains. The Aborigines has always known how to get through the Blue and, Mountains. And, and did you know that they were taking pot shots at the say, Aboriginals? This is the same How many white British children know or have been taught by our wonderful education system that three and a half million Indians volunteered to fight in the Second World War? Where is this missing? I think Kevin might have a view on that because I think I have a suspicion that you think that one of the functions of a public school is to inculcate certain kinds of dogma that are meant to produce certain sorts of political Absolutely. fallout. I mean, I mean, I mean, again, I can only go by what my father said because, again, he was very good at um, indoctrinating me with the kind of rhetoric that he believed in. But he said that you know, I mean, if you go to a public school, that you you know. That, the whole education system is based around these little kings being produced, these little princes, these little rulers. The whole thing is about inculcating people with this desire that they were born to rule, that they were born to rule in the office or businesses or in society, and that they are superior to anybody else. And because they don't come in contact, you know, with any black children, with any working class children, you know, with any girls, they're immediately taught, you know, that this is, the, you know, this is, the, we are the superior. You people. are it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And and you know, and when they go out, it's kind of like, well, we'll look for something to rule, and they're carefully slid into place where they can rule. And, and the way that, you know, just tiny children, yeah, I mean, you look at the children who go to eat and, you know, they're standing there, they're you know, 11 years old in their suits and their top hats and kind of like this, you know, and there's that marvellous picture from like, um, like 1912 of like this 11 year old child in his suit and his top hat looking totally miserable but born to rule and there are two working class urchins who are pulling his bags along behind him, exactly the same age. It's interesting you bags. say 1912, I mean, things have moved on. Oh, well, exactly. not really. Still, not they're enough. still wearing the same yes, clothes. Doesn't yeah. matter. I think it's it's why do you are so very highly educated population anymore. This country is totally elitist. It wants its population, in fact, preferably not to get educated at all, but to go into a little tunnel called training, which is even less well-resourced than education. And for people to know what to do in a factory or wherever, or not in a factory in front of a computer, and not to ask the kind of questions that an educated population would necessarily have to ask about elitism, about the haves and the have-nots, about the kind of society we now have. To, to, come, back, <clears throat> to come back to your uh, point about um, teachers struggling against their, their sort of lack of prestige, in terms of the transmission of, of, of cultural or moral values, they're often struggling against the parents. I mean, there are many occasions now where teachers uphold a moral code. They will, you know, take bullying, for instance, or stealing, they will, you know, get the miscreant and try and deal with the miscreant by bringing in the miscreant's parents. The miscreant's parents, and you know, thump them, and literally thump them, and the teachers are physically frightened of confronting parents. So you have a breakdown here which is far beyond the schools. Now, you know, as a society, we're all sort of wringing our hands about um, general collapse and moral vacuum and all that, and we're looking to the schools to say, we can't do it anymore, you do it. Now, I think this is absolutely balmy, and this, there's no way the schools can do this. And I think that, you know, in an ideal situation, uh, the schools and parents mesh together and sort of work to reinforce each other in a very constructive way. But, if you, but ultimately, schools are the, the sort of exposition of a society's values. If the society is completely up the creek, doesn't know what its values are, can't decide what it is anymore, can't decide what sort of country it wants to be anymore, can't decide whether it's going to be a third world country going down the plug hole, or it's going to be a thrusting country at the forefront of development. It just doesn't have the faintest idea what the, the identity of this country is anymore. We don't even know whether we want to have our own economy run by us anymore. We don't, we don't know where we are. And it's not surprising the schools are absolutely suffering from this. this you can't expect schools to, to sort of stand up for a coherence if the society doesn't have that coherence. There are you two know. things here. I don't want my child to be mollycoddled because of some vague kind of patronizing view that he has to be kind of cosseted. I want him to, to be stretched and people in my community and Stella's community have been asking for that for a long yeah. time. I agree with you, that, uh, with, with you on that. What I don't agree with you on is the society has changed, like Stella said. 
white children need multicultural education more than black That's children right, do. Yeah. Because they're Luddites at the moment. Our children, I'm talking now about our British children, are the worst language learners on the on the European continent. On the face of the earth. I mean. On the face of the earth. And that's partly because English it. is a lingua franca. Well, no, it's not. But it's it's partly it. because the, the English only one, think they're though. the ruling class. Exactly, and we don't, you, sorry, you don't have an empire anymore. The world has changed. We need to teach all our children how that world Great. has changed. And we, at the same time, need to stretch them. But what's happened, of course, is when people like me say, I'm for anti-racist education, the assumption is made that what I really want is for people to say, here, here, now, now, you know, you poor little black kid, sit in a corner and be very nice to you. I don't want that kind of That's often how it comes out. Yes. Mm. But because I do want English children to know about the three million. But, yes. but the feel-good factor is, is, is very important, leaving aside multicultural education for a moment, um, because it seems to me that among the various things that have gone wrong here, is that um, at, at a certain point it was sort of decided that the most important thing about the schooling and education of children was that no one should be made to feel disadvantaged or a failure. A very uh, honourable um, uh, uh, feeling, but ultimately stupid and ultimately going to do great harm to the people for whom it was ostensibly designed. Because what happened was that in order not to make people, make children feel that they were going to fail at anything, therefore there could be no standards which at which they were going to fail and therefore you couldn't actually teach Absolutely. and furthermore the whole business of teaching became removed mm -hmm. so that children were going to be facilitated to teach themselves and so you have this whole business of instead of teachers actually imparting information in a structure which might have meant that some children didn't make a grade they were teachers were, were taught to remove themselves from the process and enable children to basically teach themselves. The result has been that children from affluent backgrounds are going to make it anyway. They come from literate parents, they have books at home, they're going to be taught by their parents, many of whom are teachers who are propounding this. While at the other end of the scale, those children who need school desperately as their one route out of disadvantage, because they don't come from literate homes, they don't come from bookish cultures, are left absolutely in the mire and those are the children who are left unable to read and write at 11, at 12, at 13 who not surprisingly turn to mischief, they turn to crime no. and are then excluded from those think, schools. Think, those children were right. always left No, no they I'm were sorry. not. They right were, they from were. the beginning when, no, black they were young people, when black young people came to this country in significant numbers post-war some of them were put into ESN schools straight from the boat. No one bothered to ask whether they were intelligent and it had nothing to do with so-called trendy education. I think that's absolute rubbish. And that talk about teachers withdrawing and leaving children to learn themselves does not take account of the fact that education is a lifelong process. And what we need in schools is to impart into children the skills to carry on their own Quite. learning. Who wants to sit and have some old white male's views thrown at you Dressed so that you can regurgitate fact. them on an exam Neutral sheet. Fact. Dressed up as fact. I mean, this Dress is the, the principal problem there with, with your notion that there's a certain amount of information which is to be imparted. Uh, a, I, we're not don't that you believe that? You're no, a I don't. And I do teach all the time. There are and and there. the most important thing is to teach students to make their own inquiries and to sure. understand the nature of Absolutely. evidence. Absolutely. Because even even the the status of a fact, a pseudo fact, Absolutely. changes from year to year. You should be year. taught how to learn. You should you should be taught how to teach yourself. You should be taught where you can find knowledge. And then that way you're not getting an opinion from just one teacher or one person in authority. Or well, something charismatic. Exactly. You know, you you're, you're, you're opening where yourself education up to gone hundreds wrong. of sources of information. Delightful. Teach them how to find things. Don't stifle their creativity by giving them any facts. As you know very well, everybody knows that if you have creativity completely untrammeled by facts or experience or anything. It's like a kind of mental diarrhea. And this is what's happened. There are lots of, I mean, I see these school projects find out about transport, things like that. They're not told anything. I mean, it's like you're asking kids to reinvent the wheel every single time. And the idea that kids hate facts is not true. They love playing trivial pursuits. They love quiz shows on television. Factoids, not facts. Yes. 
These are facts or factoids, but you can tell them there are things that are quote-unquote facts, but you have to question beyond that. But the idea that children are frightened by facts, they love it. What and children you always say, did you know that the longest river was... But would you other? include in your ideal education critical faculties? Would you teach of children course, to of ask course, why? Of course. Why we are in a society... But uh, why but the critical thing is you've got to teach them You've got to, to teach them. Right. But case, then you would be asking not to why in a them. vacuum. Not no. leave them. No, yeah. all right, I'm quite happy with that. But we are not teaching our children, in fact, we are very anti-teaching our children to be really critical no, of society. No, we're doing that all the we're time not, now. Because the minute teachers do that, they're accused of being political by our tabloid press. I don't think press. that's true at all. No. I think it's oh, absolutely yes. intrinsic think... to the education system now, and the values in it, that children are, are taught to be uh, uh, critical. The trouble is they're not taught to... To, they're, no, they're not given not, the information to, to actually use their critical be faculties critical on. of the status quo. They are not taught to be critical of the status quo. But they're not the even told what the status quo is. Oh, they are taught. Is. They are no, taught. they're not. They're taught. My son, uh, who goes in instant, uh, my son goes to a very expensive private school, public school. That Reason? Maybe the fault. Uh, well, <laughs> I'm a socialist because that's the only way people like that are going to get into positions of power and influence. I made that decision. Maybe it was the wrong decision. I don't know. Maybe I'll make a different decision for my child, my daughter, because he's turning out to be extremely well educated on, on one level, but completely incapable, actually, of addressing the great inequalities we're living with, as if it's something that's God-given, because his education in this particular private school has taught him that. And I regret the, the lack of critical faculty. Um, in my, my well, son's he's head. a rotten school. That's no, it's all. not actually. It's no, no, good. I would imagine he's. Is he en route for a bank somewhere, do you think? He's en route <laughs> to become an <laughs> extremely <laughs> rich. He keeps telling me that his rebellion is going to be that he's going to be very rich, a rich lawyer in America, possibly, to break my heart. But, but yeah, that's the point, <laughs> <laughs> it can break well, your heart. In fact, he should be taught there are too many lawyers in America but already. But children get their values not from school, but from their families. Well, he gets some, he gets moral Everywhere. values, but I not mean, political to values. To say that, you know, the school is, 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 is sort of inculcating this sort of view of society is ridiculous. No, no, what no. about the entirely beneficent counter-influences well, yes, of his family? Well, yes, he has that up to a point. He, he still says he's one of two Labour voters in their mock election to please me. But he <laughs> thinks certain things cannot be questioned. He thinks inequality is a fact of life. He, and it's my fault. I've paid a huge amount of money for this child to emerge. He gets, he's got wonderful GCSE results. He'll do very well in life. But whether but he has me, you don't think he's I just think winding you up. I think the problem is you're worried, you're <laughs> worried, you're worried about whether you'll you still like him. All I'm this so money, <laughs> and I'm <laughs> like this. I don't know, actually. <laughs> I think he's going to wind you up. Melanie, you'll find he's a revolutionary, yes. after all. <laughs> Melanie, you say with such confidence that children get their values from their families. <coughs> there are three, at least three inputs that children have to take on board. One is the family, which is a bit like rain dropping on the roof. They get so used to hearing what the family thinks about this, that, and the other. The other is school uh, and what is coming down to them from, you know, the, the one-way trip to success. But the, the most important and the most insidious and the one which matters the most to them is peer group pressure, which defines itself by opposition to the other two. Our children are, are, are actually being bombarded by all kinds of expectations. Well, Jermaine, you've left out a, a really important one, and that's the surprised. media. I'm not surprised. Present program notwithstanding, the, the, the biggest influence on kids now is television I, I agree with and, you. and I the it. Nintendo. Right? And I look at my son, who is 13, and who is totally seduced, despite my good feminist they attempts to bring don't. him up in a non-violent context. He's totally, I feel, helpless well, against seduced the by movies. Or, He's seduced no, no. by movies. He's seduced Everything. by the computer games. And obviously the, the peer group feeds into that, so that, that creates more of the same. But I feel as a parent that I've lost control. Mm. And I can always remember when he was three, and he came back from school and made his first dubious comment. I can't remember what it was. But I realized with horror that that was the point at which my control as a parent was slowly going to slip out of my hands. Mm. And that I had to instill a degree of trust in his teachers because I had no choice. This business about peer group pressure, I mean, how, in your situation, how did you pick it up? Because you must have picked it up. You, you're well positioned in the middle of your, of your peer group culture, aren't you? Absolutely. Really? I mean, I, mean I, I have 
three different experiences. The first school that I went to was just a state-run school, and you know the, the catchment area was huge. So you'd have like you know the middle, good middle-class children turning up, and people who lived, you know, uh, you know, one child who was homeless, and children who lived in tower blocks. And and there the peer group pressure was very subtle, and it was just that anybody who wasn't cool was excluded. And coolness rested on a variety of things. It rested on whether you were pretty, or whether you were funny, or whether you you know you had a lot of toys, and that was about it really. Um, and I fitted into none of these things during my my infant school, um, so I was excluded. Um, but then in junior school, I realised that I had a sense of humour, and I kind of um, I, I um, forced it up a bit. I, I became the joker in the school. Um, and then when I went to the grammar school, that was completely gone. It was nothing to do with how cool you were. It was nothing to do with your personality. It was just to do with how rich your parents were and what your grades were. Um, and that, I mean, I was only there for three or four weeks, but the, the kind of bullying that I encountered, because I was the only working class child there, was appalling. I, I had um, drinks cans opened in my face and then thrown at me. I would have tramp whispered at me as I walked down the, the corridors. You know, I'd have people pinching me and, you know, one, one girl spat at me. You know, and I thought it was appalling. And I didn't tell my parents at the time because I always viewed school as something that happened, you know, that was apart from me. It was a fantasy world, and when I came home, that was real. Um, and then my parents took me out of school, and I was at home, and I experienced no peer group pressure um, from that point on, which is probably why I decided at the age of 14 it would be cool to dye my hair red and, and went forth and did it, and also probably why um, I'm exceedingly fat but don't care about it, because there was never at any point anybody saying, you know, you, you can't go to Dorothy Perkins and wear one of these dresses. That makes you rubbish. And, that, you know, and I was given self-confidence because I had no peer group. And at the time, I felt amazingly resentful about it because I had no friends, I had no social life, I just had my family. But now I'm very grateful for it. Um, but most children aren't in the lucky position where spending time at home would be a good thing. Most children dread going home. Most children do not enjoy being at home. Most children in very small, confined places where they don't get space to run around, where they're with siblings who, you know, may have a drug problem, may just have emotional problems, may be really broken up by the fact that their parents are broken up. You can't ask a single parent to teach their children. You know, it, it is impossible. In a perfect world, I would say, yes, don't send your children to school, but you can't. You can't do that. But school could become more like a family. Yes. Yes, I mean, it. if we did pay our teachers a lot more and our schools were rather less disadvantaged than they seem at the moment, would you take your son out of private education? Um, I, I would. I certainly wouldn't. I'm not sure at all what I'm going to do with my baby daughter. I was much more certain when I thought about educating my son. I think now, having experienced it, I would think again about my daughter. Um, and I have a fear of releasing her into this world called school because I know the minute she steps into that world, so much, I mean, Melanie was saying about the home and the fam and the school, so much of our values get totally um, eradicated by school. Mm. My son spoke, I speak five languages, I grew up speaking three. My son spoke my language, the language he could communicate to his grandmother in. When he was six and a half, he stopped using that language. He no longer speaks it because school told him that was an inferior thing to do. And so I'm scared. I'm scared of this world called school for, for both my children. And I would think again with, with my daughter. I'm not sure at all I would send her to a private school anymore. As usual, I'm hunting for my bit of consensus. I think one thing is very apparent, that to all of us, school is immensely important. And it's an extension of our family life and our emotional life. That's really all we've got time for. We'll be back next week. Do join us. Thank you, Anne Leslie, Melanie Phillips, Catherine Moran. Stella Dadzi and Yasmin Alipai Brown. <laughs>